Hello. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, shall we start then? All right. Sorry, uh, sorry again for everybody who's watching. Um, technical problems never fail. All right. So uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Selena Garcia. Um, I'm based in the University of Bristol, I'm currently working on drug trafficking violence in Mexico and the global war on drugs. And today I have the privilege of um, being moderating this talk about an excellent film by Eduardo Giral called Los Plebes. Okay, and for today's discussion, we have a very important guest, uh, one a very appreciated colleague, Dr. Cecilia Farfan Mendez from the University of California. And uh, um, I'm just very briefly to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, I will start with uh, our own Eduardo Giral. Eduardo was born and sorry, Eduardo was raised in Caracas, Venezuela. He studied visual arts at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and Tufts University in Boston. He currently lives in Mexico, where he does on-ground research for filmmakers, journalists, and photographers. He also scouts for individuals from high-risk contexts or remote communities to participate in films with a social narrative. His first movie, Los Deviles, premiered at the uh, Bernula, Bern, Berlin Festival um, in 2018. And then Los Plebes is his second feature film, which premiered at the Torino Film Festival. Dr. Cecilia Fanfan is based at the University of California. She's an expert on organized crime and female participation in criminal groups, among other activities. She co-founded the Mexico Violence Resorts Project, an online platform providing analysis and resources for journalists and policymakers on violence and organized crime in Mexico. All right, so this is us, the panelists for today. So without further ado, I would like to invite Eduardo Giral to give us a very brief introduction to his film, Los Plebes, or in the English translation, The Lats. Yeah. Uh, in five minutes, Eduardo, can you please tell us um, how was your experience in making this film? How did you find your participants for the film? And what you want to share with you, with us about that experience? Okay. Hey, well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, your talk to invite me to this event. And uh, most of all to Dr. Karina and, and Dr. Cecilia. Uh, you know, for me, it's an honor to be able to have, uh, uh, to ex exchange ideas about this film with, with people uh, with the level of, uh, of uh, knowledge and, 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 and experience as, 
the both of you, right? That, that was one of the main motives for me to make this film, to be able to talk to the uh, academic side, you know, to the experts. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that you saw it and you didn't thought that it was rubbish. So that makes me really uh, glad. So basically, uh, this movie, uh, I, I made it with a colleague from Sinaloa. We were working at, the, at another project. And as we were uh, doing field, field, uh, field work on different uh, communities, communities outside Culiacán, we bombed. Well, we started to encounter, of course, different uh, uh, members of the OC there, right? Uh, they were all, of course, aligned with the main uh, power holder, which is the Sinaloa Cartel. Also, some uh, were uh, some uh, follow orders from the part of the of, 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 of the Chapitos, while others from from the Mayo Zambadas, right? But you know, uh, in each town we went, there was like a, a small uh, cell, you know, that that it was a clan, and they had their sort of like a feudal lord and that feudal lord follow orders from the guys on the top. So we were uh, amazed that they were really welcoming, especially in this town. And we were able to engage with uh, a lot of the grants, right? Uh, foot soldiers. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of quality time. So after we finished that project, my colleague and I were like, hey, so if we have this access, it would, it would be a shame we don't do something ourselves, you know, with this uh, uh, with this kids uh, or youngsters. So that's when we decided to make a film, and we decided that it was going to be about uh, what they do in their free time as millennials, as centennials, right? It wasn't going to be about the violence per se. Uh, we wanted to show them as universal teenagers, and that was the main aim. And that's what the film is about. And I always say that the film is not about narcos, it's about uh, lost youth or young youngsters that were born at the wrong place in the wrong time, under the wrong circumstances, of course. Brilliant, thank you very much, Eduardo. So before we start the conversation about your film, uh, we would like to share with the audience some very short clips from the uh, film, if it's possible. Uh, so those who haven't watched them have an idea of what we're talking about.
el loco? Eduardo. ¿Eduardo qué? Eduardo Gerald Brun. ¿Y dónde eres? De Caracas. ¿De Caracas? ¿De Caracas de dónde? ¿De qué parte? Allá de Venezuela. Venezuela. ¿Y qué andas haciendo aquí en Sinaloa? Pues nada, es una película. ¿Seguro? Sí, 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 seguro. ¿Cómo se llama? ¿Para, para quién trabajas tú? ¿Haciendo películas para quién? Que trabajo por mi, por mi cuenta. ¿Por tu cuenta? Tienes que tener patrocinador a huevo. No, no, yo, yo solo trabajo. Así. Es muy arriesgado trabajar así nomás, andar grabando, viejo. Sí, pues está grabando terreno ajeno en veces. Terreno que no debe. Tiene que tener permiso pues, para poder andar grabando. ¿Sí me entiende? Sí, señor. Puede, puede grabar a mí la cara y que. Ahí la pierdo. Saluda, 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 pendejo, no seas mal educado. Levanta de la mano. Se está saludando, pendejo. Corre, te gallina, vago, vago, vago. Ahí, punto nomás, papá. Todos los días que duré para allá no le di dinero a mi jefe. 
Y vine y dije que le iba a dar, pero no sabía que no había llegado el billete. Mira, está está Quiero jugar, quiero jugar, quiero jugar, me la pelan, puto, me la pelan, la perra, yo soy el pago, la perra, hijo de la vagancia. Estamos allá en puro cerro así. Es como un mapa así, así nomás para... Porque como quien dice, ellos estaban en un hoyo y nosotros estamos arriba, pues, de ahí. Dos, Cuando el compañero que venía con nosotros se percató de que miró personas, Así, ¿no? Entonces, al momento que se percató, tiró un rafagazo. Y cuando tiró, los demás se paniquearon y tiraban y se iban yendo. Tiraban y se iban yendo. Todos se iban retirando. Iban tirando y se iban yendo porque al momento que miró que mi compañero tiró el rafagazo, ahí cayó uno muerto. Y nosotros empezamos a tirar de uno por uno. Dicen que uno de los que cayó primero... Pues no le digo que son conocidos pues, en los ranchos de la comunicación, de volada. Que él no quería venir, que él no quería venir, él no quería, pues él no quería ir. Y fue el primero que murió. Él no quería ir, pero no tenía dinero. Cuando tiraba, y yo miraba que derechito a mí venía, yo miraba la lumbre derechito a mí, pero miraba que se pintaba nomás como gotas de agua, pero por un ladito. Lo pintaban por un ladito, verga, decía yo, y entonces era cuando le empezaba a tirar, cuando miraba que no me pegaba. Pues yo en veces lo tomo así, puede que sea suerte, puede que no. Pero yo sé que sí existen protección de otro tipo. Más que uno no habla de eso, la gente vola, no, este está loco, que siga fumando más motas. <risa> De la caseta 4, agarrando la negra de la familia de Rita reportando, pero ahora 77.
vaguito, verga. Gente, perro, mas queria um tingo, né, velho? Pero mi perro siempre me han querido. Esta es mi cama. Así va. Pero quisiera que quedara así. Quiero una foto y me la paso. Para mandárselo a, a mi carnala. La que me regaló el perro. Hay un memorial comprobado. Ayer que me fui. Yo lo estaba auxiliando con leche y la verga y en eso me hablaron. Y ahí donde fui se, se, se tiró el perro después que me fui ahí quedó tirado. Ya sabía, güey, yo le daba leche y agua huevo. Y ya lo tuve un rato así conmigo y me vomitó. Vomitó. Este perro está enyerbado, dije. Y ya después. Ya después, después. Se quedó un rato ahí, ya, ya como que ya movía la cola. Ya salió, cagó. Y, y, y así pues se miraba huevo, porque en cuanto abría la puerta salí, salía el perro corriendo un chingo. Pues como todo humano tiene emociones, sentimientos y no todo el tiempo está uno al 100 como para recibir las cosas del trabajo. La estabilidad emocional está bien cabrón controlarlo. Y yo ahí ahorita ya, ya lo estoy superando una madre, ya mejor que antes. Pues muchas veces vale más la libertad pero del pensamiento pienso yo porque... Puede ser libre y, y, y mentalmente puede estar encerrado pues en algo que... Pues cuando yo estuve encerrado en el bote y que salí, estar encerrado en una casa a mí me ahogaba. No me sentía libre. Y dormía arriba de la casa o estaba un rato adentro de una casa y no podía. Me salía, me salía, pero... Me daba cuenta que la mente era la que me traía así porque yo me sentía encerrado, pero mentalmente. Pues.
te voy a decir algo, enfermo. Si a mí me dejaba el banco salir, yo me saliera a este negocio. Pero neta. ¿Y si me entiende? En, en, en tu tiempo, en tu momento, rifa machine. Porque tu momento se te oye, pero de repente... Pero pues... Llega un momento que hay otro... Que llega otro más verga que tú, que te tumba y... Que te tumba y no te van a recordar. Así nomás. En mi cumpleaños. Todo el tiempo en mi cumpleaños, viejo. El viejo me dice que sí que quiero el regalo. Y en los seis años que yo tengo chameando con él, en los seis años todo el tiempo me pregunta que sí que, que quiero en mi cumpleaños y todo. Me dice, no, ¿por qué, qué, ¿qué es lo que ocupa acá? ¿Qué ocupa acá? Para regalarse en su cumpleaños. Y si me haces esa pregunta, viejo, ¿qué, qué quiere que me regale mi cumpleaños? Te voy a decir que me saque, que me mueva el terreno en caliente. Me abro así nomás. Pero me avera, machine, a otro lado. Chambear en lo que cayera, de peón, carpintero, de lo que fuera, viejo. Y me sale. La neta. No hay me cae aquí, Lili. Busca algo ahí como que nos podamos matar. ¿no? Adentro, adentro. Y no tiene salida por atrás de casa. Con la extensión, va. Con la extensión. Casi, casi, no, pero para traerme lo aquí, vale, de verdad. ¿Está ahí si se un director, no? Sí. Aquí hay. Una marcada que lo tengo.
¿Le sacaste el tiro arriba? No tenía. ¿Y no le subiste? No. que metan eso para adentro si ¿Sí se la conoce no está muy grande con todo el cuerpo ¿eh? si ya nomás no lo amarramos lo traemos amarrado en pareja bien la parte van a ver los rifles significa me ponen suspenso Okay, so that was a very, very interesting selection of the, the most iconic bits of, of, of the film. So we're going to start the conversation now with Eduardo. So for those who are following us, uh, just for you to know, we will have around, let's say, 30, 35 minutes for the three of us to talk about this film. And then I'm going to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience um, because of the time limitations and because this film is so rich, um, we're gonna limit the conversation to four, let's say, to four topics, okay? With the intention of getting to know better the, the participants that uh, Eduardo met for this film. So one of those topics is um, uh, poverty, their, the second topic is their relief system, you know, the, their values, um, what their aspirations, and so on. Uh, we will also focus on the different types of violence they experience in their life, you know, and domestic violence, maybe abuse, maybe gender violence, gun violence, or dysfunctional families, and so on. And finally, we would like to talk about the recruitment process if you know a little bit how that happened, Eduardo. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start with a question for you. That's going to be the format, Eduardo. Um, Cecilia and I will ask you questions about these four topics. And for the audience, by the way, obviously in the Q&A, you can ask whatever you want. We just have to, you know, narrow it down to these four topics. So my first question, Eduardo, for you is about... Um, their life stories a little bit. I know in the film, as we saw, there's like one main character, which is uh, who is uh, La Vagancia, right? Um, but I'm sure that you met a lot of young people. And I love the way you describe this film because I think it's just spot on. This is not about narcos. This is about lost youth. And I completely agree with you. Um, so can you Tell us a little bit more about what they told you about their families, their fathers, their mothers, their, their childhood. Yeah, so uh, the interesting aspect was that uh, despite the fact that, that, that uh, most of them uh, 
came from the same uh, rural community because I couldn't call it a, a town, you know, there's like no paved ways. It's just like a, you know, it's just like a, a bunch of houses with a, with a, their roads and some of the lucky ones have a, a street lights. So all of them are, are from there. Uh, but they each one of them has like a different background. So the main character, you know, the one whose face you actually see, uh, he is uh, he comes from a you know he he he, he was raised with a with a single mother uh, who worked uh, doing she worked as a house cleaning you know doing house cleaning uh, and she had. He had other or other uh, uh, siblings, uh, but he was like the most problematic one. And since you know his mom was too busy working, you know, she couldn't like be uh, on top of him. But like he doesn't come from like a broken family, you know. The house where we film, you can hear him say, "Oh, if my grandmother walks by, she's gonna have like a heart attack." So. There was like a really close uh, uh, family uh, uh, net there, you know. Uh, however, he did get hooked up on uh, crystal meth at a young age, and that's what, uh, in a way, uh, took him to the streets, right? And uh, he was involved in some. You know, sometimes of like petty thief, nothing really important. But he told me that the like the moment that he got his act together was when he for I, I don't I don't remember how. And this is like the second story that starts the same way because I was in Tecate interviewing a a coyote, you know, a a a, a, a people smuggler. And he told me that he got into the business in the same way, which is they were both, they were cleaning cars. And one of their main clients was like a, a, a local crime lord. And the local crime lord got, you know, a fun of him. And like, he told him, hey, why don't you work for me? And the protagonist tells me that for him, this is like the before and after in his life in a in the in in a good sense you know because before he was like you know cleaning cars uh, you know there was like no sort of discipline no aim and then this uh, local lord came and told him to work for him so he had to get his his act together right uh, because there is discipline once you work there and uh, so that's that was his story while uh, the younger kid which i don't know if we if the audience was able to see him on the clip i choose now i don't know which is like the counterpart uh, we call him pete he's the youngest of all he's like he was 17 when we were shooting 17 16 and uh, his mom is a nurse he comes from like a solid middle ground, a middle class background, you know. His house is well furnished. He has a widescreen TV on his apartment. And he actually won a national Olympic competition in Sinaloa, right? He's an expert with computers. He spends all the time when he's not when he wasn't working for the uh, a criminal group. Uh, he was playing Call of Duty or any other video game. You would find a teenager like him, but from maybe uh, I don't know Sweden. You know, whatever. Uh, so you know, but he also didn't. Uh, his father wasn't completely absent. His father was an ex uh, federal cop, federal police who got addicted to drugs and to alcohol. And he, you know, he got kicked out of the force. And all, of course the mom left him, uh, but he wasn't completely away, but he was mostly absent. 
And that was like a huge thing for him. But at the same time, he had a sister, he has a grandmother, you know? And then we have this like, uh, there's this character that is like a, a, a fat guy, a fat teenager who is also like 17, 18. And he actually comes from a... Sorry, Eduardo, somebody is asking us, Luca is asking, what, what were the youngest kids? How old were they, the youngest that you met? 16. 16. 16. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, then, you were I, talking about the, 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 the fat one. Oh, yeah. So then, then uh, the, this, uh, the computer geek, uh, he had a, a best friend who was this fat teenager. And this fat teenager came from a, from, from a family clan that was really well known in the town as being part of the local tribe group. And uh, his dad had been really important, and his brothers were lieutenants from the current for the current uh, crime world. So he came from, let's say, like a crime dynasty. Uh, and then you know there was another son of a carpenter. Uh, there was another who, both of his parents were uh, uh, happily married and. You know, one of them is his dad worked for the electricity company. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't the typical uh, idea that people have of like, you know, broken homes and those right. type of situation. And I, and I really like what you're saying about this is not necessarily dysfunctional, even though you're talking about, for example, in the case of La Gavarancia with a single, you know, a family with with just like the mother usually it's understood in Mexico dysfunctional family just because the of the absence of the father so I really like that your approach that not necessarily because we don't have the authority or the figure of the father is necessarily dysfunctional so from what you're saying I, I can see that maybe more than dysfunctional families we're talking about children that per perhaps were neglected in the sense that you know they, they were alone a lot most of the times and the other common thing that i noticed from what you were saying is drug addictions perhaps in the in one case it was the the youngster himself who got addicted and in the other case the father but you, you have you know drug addiction on, or let's say a drug drug misuse as a constant perhaps yeah yeah well, yeah definitely all of them also even uh, the 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 youngest one who won the Olympic contest. Mm. He told us that for the Olympic contest, it was, it was mathematics, like, right? Yeah, yeah, mathematics. It was yeah. quite clever. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was... But he was doing like cocaine before the test. And that's why he finished so fast, and he won a prize. Yeah, but the the, the drug factor was present uh, with all of them. You know, of course, each one of them had their own let's say, drug of choice, you know, right. some was freestyle, other was cocaine, other was, uh, you know, it's for me silly to say weed as a drug, but well, yeah, some of them like more weed and others were more into, uh, uh, you know, uh, Buchanan and, uh, and Atacan. Legal drugs. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I have so many follow-up questions, but we really need to hear from Cecilia. <laughs> so sorry, Cecilia. So, no, Please no, you're, you're the good. And thank you so much for inviting me to have this conversation. Of course, it's always great to um, discuss with Eduardo his work. So I think one of the things that is very interesting to me, and especially building on what you were just discussing, is that oftentimes we hear this link of, well, if there's poverty, there is an obvious link to crime. And of course, we know the relationship is not that clear, and especially in a context like Mexico, where if poverty alone would explain crime, then of course, you know, the levels that we would see would be much higher. And so what is your sense of how poverty, especially in a context like Sinaloa, that I would argue has, you know, greater, you know, economic opportunity compared to other areas in Mexico like Guerrero, how does this, you know, lack of opportunity or poverty play out um, in in you know some of these life trajectories that we see with Los Plebes. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting because the neighbor of the protagonist uh, was a brick maker. And I don't know if people uh, know like know, but you know, 
because of brick making maybe in like Europe and the US is some, it's like they, they think we're talking about a hundred years ago, but in Asia, Africa, in Latin America is something that a lot of people uh, depend, you know, to, to feed their family, building bricks. And it's a really hard uh, uh, and, and tough type of work. You know, you're like with fire under the sun, for like 10 hours a day, you know, making basic, making bricks. And of course, bricks, the, the amount people pay for them are not that much. So his neighbor was a brick maker and it was his age. They would actually sometimes hang out, but he was, he had no interest in joining the, the same uh, criminal outfit uh, that uh, our, our, our protagonist was involved with. So, and at the same time, and, and this is something that uh, uh, a, a, a colleague from Mexico, uh, Froilan Enciso, who is from Sinaloa and uh, some, someone that I admire a lot, he told me once, he was like, you know, you and I share the same thing. And that is that we focus on the few that take the rogue path, but we don't focus on most of the youngsters that rather make bricks or work in a 7-Eleven. And that's true. Also, and the amount of money they get paid for working for these uh, OCs, it's not that much. Uh, the protagonist was making $400 a month. Uh, and that means that it's like a, that was a, a plain uh, fee and he could get asked to do as many as things as the boss wanted. So it wasn't like, okay, I'm gonna pay you this, but if I ask you to go and kill 10 guys in one weekend, I'm gonna pay you more. No, it was like, I'm gonna pay you this. And for that, you basically need to give me all of your violent potential. So I was like, okay, so he's, made, he's making, almost what a, someone at working at, at the 7-Eleven makes, you know, 4,000 pesos a week, even, and with the exception that the guy from the 7-Eleven gets paid every month. In this case, they sometimes they would, they would spend like three months without getting paid because there's no transactions, digital transactions. So all the cash, they need to move it uh, through cars. And sometimes the cars get stopped by the sold by the government, or they have accidents, so the money doesn't arrive. So, as as you said, it, it's, for me, it's not a poverty thing. Of course, it's one of the factors of this perfect storm. But you know, uh, India has much more poverty, and they don't have the, the type of crime that we have. Or Cambodia, uh, Laos have much more poverty, and 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 they you know they don't have. Uh, this type of 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 criminal outfits, uh, of course. Maybe you can talk about Myanmar. They have a similar concept, and they do have, you know, huge armies of sicarios. But you know, but it's not because of poverty. It's, it's for, for me. It's uh, uh, I mean, it's basically like the the street capital and the network of poverty that surrounds it. You know, uh, also uh, uh, you know being like orphan citizens in the sense that the guys who control violence is not the government, but non-state actors. So you depend on them for the protection of your family. So that is also a huge incentive to join them, right? Uh, also, you know, uh, well, I don't know, Cecilia, yeah, please uh, cut me off of whatever you want because I, 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 I can talk about, about how poverty is not the main, uh, you know, source of. I want to jump in as well. <laughs> Sorry, sure. it's just jump because in, yeah. I think it's it, it's just it's quite linked to what you are saying in terms of poverty. Obviously, poverty does not explain. It's not the only variable, and definitely on its own, it doesn't explain violence. So that's why I wanted to ask you in in this sense, what are the values? What are the beliefs? Because from my perspective, a very qualitative perspective, I, I do believe that we really have to under identify and understand what they understand as 
truth, what, 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 how they see the world, what makes sense for them, what is the, how do they see the world? So um, in, the, in, in one of the videos that we saw earlier, somebody was talking about respect. So I wanted to ask you about masculinities, that the classic concept of you know, toxic masculinities in the sense of I, I need to be tough, you know, um, maybe it's a stereotype, but I have this image of people, you know, men, you're usually in Mexico, but especially in Sinaloa, that, you know, they are quite aggressive in order to be a man, or, you know, to be regarded as a man, you have to display certain behaviors and violence is some of them. So what do you think about this? Do you think well, that these beliefs or this sort of very violent masculinity plays a role in this? Well, I think that it's like, a, you know, a, the context creates and the circumstances shape the men, right? So if you are, you know, if you are born in, in, in Silicon Valley, you want to make sure you're like a tech geek, right? And you know a lot about technology and, and, app, and apps and, and, all, and, and all that. Uh, here, uh, in, in, in Sinaloa, uh, but also Colombia, like a lot part of Mexico, but like Central America, uh, violent is an asset, a really important asset. And this construction of masculinity uh, has a lot to do about having or transmitting the necessary uh, violent reputation and also a lack of fear reputation, right? So that way, even if you are not going to be an agent of coercion and profit from your capacity to inflict violence, you want to make sure that people know that if they mess with you or your family, you can uh, create pain to them. Uh, you can inflict pain to them or their loved ones. And that in a context where, as I said before, we, we have like an orphan citizenship where the monopoly of violence is in the hands of non-state actors. Uh, for the survival, it's, it's also really, it's, it's really important, you know? And, and I think that has to do with this idea of this construction of, of this uh, type of masculinity, you know, tough, intimidating, you know, that type. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cecilia, you want to carry in with your questions? Yes, we have I mean, three just... questions already from the audience, but I'm going to wait for the at the end, okay, to, to, to mention them. Um, sure, sounds good. So let me, um, building on this idea of, you know, recruitment and values, I mean, to what extent, um, you know, this is based in Sinaloa, but it could be many other parts of Mexico, right, especially these sort of low-level outsourcing of violence that we see. And so I'm wondering what conditions do you think explain seeing, you know, because drug trade is not new in Mexico either. And so if we think about that particular criminal activity, it's not new, but certainly we, we see a lot more of the young men that you feature um, in your documentary yeah. in recent years. And so I'm wondering how you think of how organized crime has also shaped, you know, the recruitment of, you know, these young men um, into these, these groups. Yeah, and, 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 and the theory about, a, a, you know, a franchise model or, you know, a, I think explains a lot about what has happened in Mexico and why uh, we are seeing the level of a, a violent competition, right, between different actors and why maybe in the 90s there was a type of like Pax Mafiosa that we can't find right now. And uh, I think that, yeah, like you said, we can find this type of scenes in, uh, in, Mexi in all of Mexico, but I, I think Mexico has a, uh, a reality that is as complex as the one you would find in Syria, you know, where you, a town, you know, you go to a town and there are Druze, and then you go to, other, to the other town and there are Sunnis, in the sense that if you take a, a, a Cessna from Chiapas to Sinaloa, you think that you are in two different countries. And in a sense, you are, right? Uh, I don't think I would, be, I would have been able to make this movie. For example, uh, 
in Tamaulipas, right? Or maybe uh, Jalisco right now, uh, because of the type of the type of criminal structure you have there. I see that Sinaloa has much more of a hierarchical structure. So in a way, there's more, and this is gonna sound really silly, I know, but there's much more accountability inside Sinaloa. I know that once like you, because what happens a lot and and, uh, and that happens uh, with the, this concept of a uh, foreign colonization is that when the Sinaloan guys go to Zacatecas, so they act in a way that they wouldn't act in Sinaloa, right? But in Sinaloa, they, because everything is much more uh, pyramidal, everyone needs to ask someone for, per for permission before they do something. So that was what uh, keep us safe, right? Uh, but uh, so that's something that in Tamaulipas is completely a, 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 a will type organization. You know, it's like basically the Cartel del Golfo uh, or whatever is left of Los Zetas or La Tropa del Infierno. They're basically renting their name to whoever is the best buyer. And okay, you're able to call yourself Cartel del Golfo and you can do whatever you want as long as you give us this percent of money. So that way you have so much chaos, you know, and and so and and there's no uh, economy of violence, you know, to put it in a more like rational approach way. Uh, okay, sorry, Eduardo, I, I want to interrupt you because we only had 15 minutes left. So I just have one more question. We have four questions from the audience and maybe one more question for Cecilia. Uh, so my question is as well linked to what you, you were saying and to Cecilia's question about what's new, what's, what is that, because it's true that drug violence in Mexico or drug trade, sorry, is, has been there since the 80s, but how can we explain, you know, this increase of violence? And I was thinking about what you mentioned long time ago in one of our conversations, you were mentioning the millennials, you know, these new generations who are not afraid of showing their faces and in, in, in social media, on Instagram, even TikTok, they, they want to be recognized. So I was, I was thinking, do you think that perhaps these new generations uh, are, are less concerned with secrecy and with being like low level because they want some sort of, you know, one way to access to this respect is through social media? Do you think that has something to do with it? Well, uh, I think it's, it's true that the concept of uh, anon, anon, ano, sorry, uh, ¿cómo se anonymity? Dice? anonymity uh, in, um, in crime has, has completely been changed by centennials and millennials. You know, before it was, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, you wouldn't expect any type of criminal to be show enough, you know? Nowadays, is what they do. Uh, you know, I have, I follow some, a lot of them through Instagram and they show that they're really explicit with, uh, with their, their doings, right? And so that's why at the same time, it's funny that when you're filming them, you're like, hey, they, they try to get a little bit cocky, like, hey, you, should, you can't film that. And you're like, man, but you're, Social network is full of this, like who cares, right? But I don't think that it has any correlation with the amount of violence and uh, that we're seeing nowadays. Thank you. Okay, so shall we start with the questions from the audience? Um, so, okay, so Fernando Salvador is asking if were any of the youth in education um, and then he also asked, did they get drugs for free? Was the drug addiction their weakness? Um, let's deal with those two and then I ask you the other ones. So by ed education, I, I don't know what does that mean? I, I assume, uh, Fernando, if you want to clarify, but what I understand is perhaps were they studying, I don't know, high school or even a career? The, the ones that you met, what was yeah. the highest level of education they had? So there were two that they did 
first year of college and then they, they drop out. One actually started doing uh, studying uh, criminology. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And the others, did they and finish, the, I don't know, middle school yeah. or elementary school? And, and the others, they drop out when they were like 15, 16 year old. Yeah. All right. Okay. And the other question is, did they get drugs for free? I assume, did they get drugs for free working no. in the organization? No, this is, the, this is the thing with drugs. And this is a tricky question. And, and I think people, I don't know why people don't talk about a, a type of like a bondage, a, 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 and slave debt, right? But what, they, what, they, what do organized crime uh, do? That sounds really silly, but with this, this group in particular, what they do is like, they'll give you drugs for free while you're working with them. So while you're patrolling the streets, that's how they call when they're in their cars with their gears and they're patrolling. Yeah, they'll give you free drugs. But then they'll give you drugs, but you have to sell them. And if you consume more than that, than what you sell, you're in trouble. And all of them were in debt with a criminal organization. All of them had to, like, it was a huge source of stress, source of stress that they were like, oh man, like I, they gave me this much to sell, but I consumed half. So now I owe them. And that gave the organization power. And I think it was something completely strategic because why would you give a gunman uh, or a grant drugs to sell? You have someone else that sells the drugs for you. So I think that they know what they're doing. Yeah. Okay, so Emilio is asking, what do the families of these youngsters think about their involvement? Are they happy, worried, indifferent? Well, it, it, it depends on the uh, on which character. With the protagonist, uh, the thing is like there's a there's some in some parts. I don't want to generalize. Joining uh, any crime cell related to these big cartels is like joining the army, uh, you know, in the US. It's not something that, uh, you know, crazy, it's not seem bad, right? Uh, because again, since there's no, since there's no, uh, well, there's government, but the ones who enforce the law or the shadow law are the, the, the drug cartels they see them as a, as a, as a source of a, a authority. Uh, so uh, they don't see them as something bad, you know? Of course, it depends, uh, again, in the social class. Uh, the, 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 the teenager who was really good at math and with computer, of course, his mom didn't know what he was up to. She didn't know he had a AK-47 under his bed and all of that, right? Uh, but because he had like one foot on the middle class uh, citizen, uh, citizenship and one foot on the shadow citizenship. Yeah, thank you, Eduardo. So um, um, we have roughly six to seven minutes. So if the rest of the audience has any question, please send them to the chat. And in the meantime, Cecilia, I know you have a last question. Sure. So, you know, I I would be remiss if I didn't ask because this morning I also was on a panel about gender and organized crime. And so, of course, in your documentary, we only follow men and young men. And so the question is, you know, to some extent, the women are featured in the sense of the aspiration of having a girlfriend or, you know, when they talk about women. But I'm wondering, during the process of, you know, filming their activities, um, what was your perception of how women may participate uh, in these levels of crime or if they're involved in, in other um, activities or, you know, where, where are the women, um, you know, in the process of filming this? Okay, so again, uh, as I said before, I can only talk about Sinaloa uh, because I know it's different uh, in Michoacan and in Ciudad Juarez, there's more presence of women, especially uh, in the lower skills, uh, with the lower skilled workers for the organized crime, which is, I was with the lowest, with the low skilled workers. I wasn't uh, high up. 
I, I don't think I would be here if I had tried to film high, more high up, you know. Uh, so in Sinaloa, the presence of women uh, that I was able to uh, see was in more, in more higher up uh, uh, ladders, right? We did try to ha have like a female uh, uh, gun woman and we found one, but she was the uh, bodyguard of the daughter of a big narcos. And, and based of our research, every time we, the, you know, the few uh, women we find, they were in higher up positions in the organization. So what, what I, I see is that as a woman uh, in Sinaloa, the most common uh, 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 situation you find is that they they came from families who are part of the organ of, of the company as they, as they call it. So that enables them to join, but in upper ranks. Uh, if as a woman, if you try to do, to work yourself up from a spotter, uh, you know. Uh, a uh, uh, lookout uh, girl in that sense, you know, with a radio, just just uh, saying where the soldiers come and all that. I haven't met the first uh, uh, spotter or lookout girl uh, in Sinaloa. So I think that if you're like a poor girl that doesn't have any connections, that your street capital is really poor or your criminal capital is really poor, it's really hard for you to, to rise up in Sinaloa, because I know that I, I, I know uh, colleagues who have worked uh, Tamaulipas and Juarez and they've met other types of situations. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you, Eduardo. So somebody in the audience is asking if you have in mind to do like a sequel, the second part of Los Plebes, is that a possibility? Well, no, no, it, it, it's not. It, well, we, we, I'm, a, I'm working right now on a short film uh, made from footage that was filmed by the protagonist. So after he finished his, uh, well, what happened with the protagonist that his boss uh, got, uh, he went to prison. And usually uh, there's nothing more uh, vulnerable than an orphan sicario, and that sounds funny, but once your boss is out, every grudge he created, they're gonna they're gonna look for you to you know to to as a payback. So usually when they kill or they arrest the boss, the sicario, the 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 gunman, they have to or leave town or they usually get killed. In the case of the protagonist, he have to move to. He had to go to Guerrero, uh, where he find work uh, as a as a gunman for another member of the Sinaloa cartel, who was fighting other groups there. And, and while he was there, because of the experience with us, he started shooting, filming a lot of his uh, daily life for like a year. So I saw him a year ago. He told me, hey man, you know what? I have all this material. I don't want to, I, I don't want for them to be lost if I get killed. And I, I want to give it to you. So I took it and they're like five hours and 200 photos. So I'm publishing a photo book uh, in the Netherlands or through, through a Netherlands editorial on January about the photo that this guy took and then with the videos, I'm working on a short film, right? Because you know, it's, there's also, it's also different. Like, what's, sorry, what's the title of the photo book? Uh, it's uh, uh, Sicario Warfare, which uh, Karina also helped me out with with, with, with the prologue. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, so that, but it, it, you know, I don't think I would call it a sequel. But it's related to 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 the players. 
Thank you so much, Eduardo. We only have one minute left, so I don't want to say anything else, but thank you so much for uh, sharing this amazing film with us. Um, I honestly believe this is a great contribution to our knowledge and understanding of these lost years. And I love the way you chose the images and the angles that you allow us to see with this film. Every time I watch it, I find something new. And every time I watch it, I feel different emotions. Thank you so much, Eduardo. I really enjoyed the film. Cecilia, last words. Yeah, just echo what Karina said. Thank you again for inviting me to have this conversation. I learn every time we get a chance to discuss um, your work. And certainly I hope everyone who joined us today has a chance um, to watch it. And certainly we look forward to, you know, your upcoming work. So thank you for the invitation. Definitely. Uh, Eduardo, last final word. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I read both of Cecilia's and Karina's thesis more than once. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had read them before I, I, I started filming this project. I think I would have been, uh, I, I would have approached the subject with a different perspective, much more sophisticated. Uh, but uh, both of your work uh, your, and your research have helped, has, has helped, helped me uh, mature uh, a lot. Thank you so much, Eduardo. So that's it. Thank you so much, everybody who joined us. I just had a message from Luca saying that it was worth waking up in the middle of the night. That says it all. So thank you, everybody, again. And keep enjoying these 24 hours of organized crime talks. Good evening, Bye. good day, good whatever Bye. you have. Bye-bye.